So this, our hot take on sustainable packaging, is sustainable packaging getting a bad rap? Um, we're looking at plastic packaging as a major environmental concern, but are new materials really the answer? Uh, we're going to go through a quick hot take for you in about an hour, just grabbing at some of the main issues, talking to some of the experts and getting a feel for uh, what's happening out there. These are designed as uh, quick updates um, rather than a sort of comprehensive, you know, super technical walkthrough. They're really a chance for us to, in our network to talk to ourselves and have a good chat about these things. So welcome, welcome. Uh, my name is Andy Kenworthy. I am the Senior Communications Advisor at the Sustainable Business Network. I'll be taking you through the next hour. And with us, we've got uh, a group of fantastic panelists. We've got Bex Pekeski from Better Packaging. We've got Aidan Sharp from Punchbowl, James Ferrier from Biofab, and Marion Wood from Common Sense Organics. In just a brief moment, they're going to introduce themselves and give you a little rundown of their place in this sector and what they're up to. And maybe a little touch on some of the issues they're seeing out there. And then what we're going to do is get together with a panel uh, with all the, all, the, all the four of them to have a quick chat. I'll run some questions by them, but throughout you can pump your questions into the chat box because um, there's quite a few of us here uh, and then um, we'll we'll ask them to them in a, in a section later on, on as we finish as well. And we may even get a chance for you to chat direct. We'll see. We'll see how shocker we are with folk. So welcome, welcome. So first off, I'll introduce Bex. Bex is from Better Packaging. She will no doubt introduce herself and what Better Packaging is up to and what we're seeing in the market. Take it away, Bex. So oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. I, I'm going to just share my screen with you. Just give me a second, please, which would be great. Um, just a minute, put that down there. I just lost my little, there he is. Sorry. I did so well in the practice as well. I think it's that one there. Share. Can you guys all see that? Yep, looking good. Thank you. Amazing. Uh, so yeah, I'm Bex and I'm one of the co-founders of the Better Packaging Co. And in 2017, my business partner Kate and I sent out to design a more sustainable career satchel. And we weren't on a mission to produce a home compostable one, although that's where we ended up. And what we did is we evaluated everything according to the circular economy principles and those principles still drive the business today and I'm sure you've all seen this diagram up on the um, on the board and it shows a circular economy um, and in a linear economy we know that materials only flow in one way we take resources from the ground and we make products which we use and when we no longer want them we throw them away and they're wasted so this real take make waste and we call this a linear economy and a step in the better direction is the recycling economy but the ultimate is the circular economy and it's defined by the Alan MacArthur Foundation as being based on the principles of designing out waste and pollution and keeping materials and products in use and regenerating natural systems. And it's that concept that drives everything we do at Better Packaging. Um, every product we develop, every decision we make, it's really our core philosophy. And we really believe that waste is a design flaw and that through clever design and systems thinking, we can completely design out waste and it can be eliminated. It's estimated that approximately 80% of all waste is actually created at the design floor. So we really should be considering products to be developed to consider that whole life cycle. Sourcing, manufacturing use and end of life uh, options and it all starts with design. This terminology is relatively new over the last sort of five or six years and before I started better packaging I hadn't really even heard of it. But the concept's been around forever in nature. Uh, and I think when you look at nature, nothing gets wasted. So in 2018, we launched a home compostable career satchel uh, and a range of packaging options for the e-commerce industry. And we always knew and openly said at that time that the future of our packaging would always look very different from what we first went to market with because we were on this journey. And we knew that we had something that was good, but there was always an option to make things better. And neither Kate or I actually had any packaging experience prior to launching Better Packaging, and we've really used that to our advantage, is we're completely materials independent. So we really are looking at products uh, based on what is the most sustainable option at that point in time with that knowledge that will continually evolve. And our compostable range has been incredibly successful. However, a couple of years ago, 
we realized that it wasn't just enough to reduce the negative impacts of packaging. We actually could and wanted to do more. So we decided to see if we could use packaging to do a whole heap of good. And once again, using that circular economy thinking, we asked ourselves, what would the ideal packaging solution look like? And so we removed any preconceived ideas of what packaging was and imagined what it actually could and should be. And where we landed was that we really needed to harvest this mess we've made, all of the pollution in the world could actually be used as a resource. Uh, uh, we've actually used up enough natural resources, let's just harvest what we've got. And we've done that by launching late last year a range of packaging made from 100% ocean-bound plastic pollution. And we can pretty much make any kind of flexible film with it, polygarment bags, courier bags, food grade options, you name it. And what I really love about the solution is that it's not only cleaning up the environment, it has this incredible social side because we're paying people with limited, limited access access to consistent worker fair wage to collect pollution off their beaches. And so you've got a product that's doing its job uh, because packaging actually plays a part uh, in that it protects goods, but it's also replacing virgin options and also delivers on 13 sustainable development goals. It has an incredibly low carbon footprint, 75% less of other equivalent packaging. So this is an independent study done by one of our really well-known apparel merchants, and they were looking at all of the options available to them. We we're also looking at reusables. Uh, we launched a reusable courier satchel about two years ago, um, and our goal by 2030 is for all better packaging to be reusable, made from 100% pollution and or a waste source recyclable back to full material and biodegradable in both marine and land environments. I believe we all need to be incredibly agile and keep our minds open as technology is just changing so quickly. And there's just going to be so many different solutions to get us where we need to be. I think we need to be really careful when we're making policy decisions as well, is that we don't create these blanket rules that prevent some of these new technologies that are coming through uh, due to technicalities. But yeah, really looking forward to digging a bit deeper into some of the questions you might have. That's just a quick blast on the last five years of our business. And we'll stop sharing. Awesome. Thanks so much. And it yeah, probably felt like it went that fast at times as well. And other times incredibly slowly. Um, so, uh, yeah, really inspiring to see waste being reused in that way. I think that's going to be a part of the future for definite for us, whether we like it or not. Over to Aidan Sharp from Punchbowl. I was just going to do the same, just intro us and tell us a little bit about what they're up to. Thanks for that, Andy. Can uh, everyone hear me all right? Yeah, great. Perfect. I'm going to share my screen as well. I, um, I'm a bit of a visual learner, so I've prepared some slides as well, but I promise it's only a few. Don't want to bore anyone too much. Um, so, yeah, thanks for that intro, Andy. Uh, Beck's awesome presentation, hard to follow that up as always. But, um, yeah, I wanted to take a moment to introduce Punchbowl Packaging um, and a little bit of our approach to sustainable packaging for a specific example of the Kaituna blueberry story. Um, so I've got a few slides here. Oh, let me see if it's working. There we go. So who are Punchbowl Packaging? Well, we're based down in sunny Pukekohe. Um, some people call it the veggie growing mecca or at least one of the areas in New Zealand. Um, we're a little bit quirky and a little bit unique in the sense that we belong to a group of companies, a branch of which is actually a grower as well. So we on site have uh, kiwi fruit and blueberries being grown and packed. And that's allowed us to be quite close to produce, which is quite an exciting story to understand how it handles well. Uh, we, we look, Quite, we have quite a wide lens on what we're looking at around the world. So innovation-wise, we're constantly looking what's coming out, uh, being very critical of it and validating these materials and applications and seeing what we can make accessible that is reasonable to brands here in New Zealand. Um, and then finally, we do have some unique concepts and things design coming up. We've got some clever cookies within the team that all that work that I mentioned before. Luckily, I don't have to do too much of it. Uh, that some work. Um, but we are looking to make sure that we get the right fit for the right brand because in our eyes, no two brands are the same. And the way that kind of branches out for Punchbowl packaging is that horticultural um, branch that I mentioned before. So quite, being quite close to the produce, sustainable packaging and automation, which kind of goes hand in hand with those past two elements. But you might have heard me mention that we actually grow and pack blueberries as well. Um, and this is the Kaituna blueberries development I wanted to speak to because it's a really good example of setting yourself guidelines and how we kind of approach that sustainable packaging challenge. So blueberries, most of you will have seen them around before. I tried one, I hope. They're delicious here in New Zealand. 
Um, they tend to come in the little uh, plastic fan shells you've seen around before. And we want to set some objectives and challenges to give ourselves a target to achieve something a little bit more new, a little bit more innovative and disruptive. So um, you can see a few of the goals that were set out there. Um, we thought about reduction. Hey, how can we reduce our reliance on the plastic material where possible? Um, renewability, as we move away from plastic, what does that look like? Can it be a renewable material? Uh, end of life, some of you would have heard the class debate, you know, should it be compostable? Should it be recyclable? We wanted to make the opportunity to empower the consumer to do both here. Um, appeal, so look and feel on shall. How do people resonate with the material and uh, are they familiar with it? Resealability, uh, making sure that once the fruit pack is open, you can seal it again for fruit quality and longevity. Uh, practicality, so tamper evidence just comes down to that food safety standard. Uh, we want to make sure where possible we can fit it with the existing process. That's quite handy when making big changes. And then finally, in that bottom right corner, you might see highlighted a 10% packaging weight reduction. And it might not sound like a big figure, but we know from the weight hierarchy that reduction is right at the top has some really uh, positive benefits. So um, a little bit harder than it, than it sounds to um, actually achieve. So what was the final result? Well, these are the Kaituna Blue Ridge you see in front of you. It went on to win a few awards. The um, gold, pa uh, gold Packaging Award for PETA uh, and the same with Packaging Design Materials, as well as two World Style Packaging Awards within the uh, materials and food category space. So really exciting to be recognized on the world stage for that development. Um, and really, we came away with two key learnings when it comes to sustainable packaging. One, that thoughtful design is really key. Think about the purpose of the packaging and set yourself some good targets to, uh, to arrive at a good outcome. And secondly, packaging speaks volume. So, hey, for most brands, packaging is one of the only physical touch points for a customer. What do you want your packaging to say about your brand, um, the quality of your product, and uh, your sustainable alignment? So going forward, we can, that's kind of a quick overview of punchable packaging as well as our approach to sustainable packaging. We continue to use the Kaituna philosophy, both for produce packaging and packaging within the industries outside of that, but I'm sure we'll get into a more of a panel uh, discussion. Back over to you, Andy. Thanks, Adam. that's fantastic. And maybe harder than it sounds should probably be the entire kind of motto of anybody trying to delve into this plastic packaging thing, <laughs> because it, as soon as you get into it, as we found with our plastic packaging masterclasses, the level of complexity just uh, gets gets deeper and deeper and in those systems that's why we like to think in systems but um i'm sure there's others on the call who've experienced that same that same feeling of wow this is a lot harder than it looks because in the public they're just oh can't you just change i've had these conversations just recently you know people say can't we just ban all soft plastics well yeah if you don't want vegetables from a very long way away you could do that tomorrow but you know you might like those things so that's what we're grappling with and thank you, thanks again, Aidan. And so we move on to James Ferrier from Biofab for another take, another angle on innovation in this space. James. Uh, kia ora, everyone. And um, yeah, I think that's just spot on, Andy, of, of recognising how hard it is to, well, you know, how challenging it is to try and find, a, 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 the, you know, a great solution in the space of sustainability. And I think, you know, when we start breaking it down into each little sector within packaging, because quite often we always expect there to be this one single silver bullet. Um, and there's this expectation that that to do something better, it needs to be 100% better instantaneously. And we found that really tough as well. Like my background was working actually in packaging as a supplier before um, we started Biofab. And when we realized that, um, there needed to be a whole lot of material development to create some solutions. That was sort of how we found our, our niche with trying to replace some of these hard to recycle plastics like polystyrene, but I'll quickly share my screen. Um, so um, yeah, kia ora everyone, my name's James. I'm one of the co-founders of Biofab and we are working with mycelium composites. Um, now we're trying to solve some pretty massive issues in relation to the production and consumption of plastics. And in particular, we are targeting uh, hard to recycle plastics such as uh, expanded polystyrene. So most of us will know this material from whether it be packaging appliances or whiteware, um, food or disposable takeaway containers, which is great in New Zealand, like this category here is, is gonna be banned in New Zealand from the 1st of October. Um, but it's also used a lot within the construction sector. And our solution is a, is a biocomposite that uses mycelium, uh, the root structure of a mushroom to, to bind together uh, agricultural waste uh, to make a composite material that we can mold um, into any shape. And it 
acts functionally as a direct replacement to polystyrene. There's also some really interesting opportunities within the construction space that, um, that we're looking at. Um, and I think this will become really relevant for New Zealand. Um, packaging um, is, a, you know, a lot of it is produced up in, up in Asia. Um, so quite often, you know, the amount of packaging we produce in New Zealand is not a massive amount. Um, but what is less known um, is that we use a lot of polystyrene in our built environment. So the, the star of our show is mycelium. Um, it's the root structure of a mushroom and this fibrous dense network is what we grow through any type of lignocellulostic or agricultural byproduct. Um, at the moment we're using hemp herd which is the, the, the wooden core of the hemp plant and if the slow time lapse plays um, you'll see a sped up time lapse of this mycelium growing through our substrate. Um, we're essentially growing or producing our glue in situ as we mould the product. Um, and at the end of it, we pop that out and we are left with um, a, uh, our, our finished product. Now, here's a very, very short video, um, which probably does a better job of explaining it than I do sometimes because I can blabber on. But um, if this plays for everyone, just let me know if the sound Mushroom comes packaging through. packaging is grown. Our product is simple, only containing two ingredients, mycelium and hemp herd. Mycelium, the root structure of mushrooms, is the biological binder, the glue that holds our product together. Hemp herd is a byproduct from the fiber hemp industry. What is normally discarded now has a purpose. Our design team begins our manufacturing process with a render and quote for your custom shape. We then CNC your custom shape and thermoform the positive to make growth trees. Our hemp and mycelium blend are added to the growth trees to grow for four days. The packaging is removed from the trays and allowed to grow for two more days. Finally, your packaging is dehydrated for one day to disable future growth. Just like that, your mushroom packaging is grown to spec and ready to protect your product in shipment. Mushroom packaging is fully home compostable. Simply break up your packaging and add to the soil to decompose in 30 days. At Mushroom Packaging, we have a goal to leave the earth in a better condition than found. Symbiotically yours, Mushroom Packaging. So some of the reasons why we're working with this technology and particularly targeting polystyrene is that historic, like there has been a lack of viable alternatives. Um, and many uses of polystyrene are being used because they need that functional performance of its insulated value or protected packaging. And quite often switching to something like cardboard simply just doesn't cut the mustard and they have to use it. Um, but now there's increasing regulation. For some time now, there's been the shifting trend towards the circular economy. So it's putting a lot of pressure on manufacturers to find sort of alternatives, which, um, um, so I think polystyrene traditionally has been a harder material to look at replacing because of um, these factors, but um, we're really excited to be working with the, the mushroom composites um, to look at finding a solution there. So I think I will, I will cut that there. Um, um, some of the, we'll, we'll talk about these figures more in the q and I'm sure, but um, I'll stop sharing my screen and hopefully that wasn't too over time, Andy. That's fantastic, we're, we're spot on time. It's quite quite incredible, good effort, good effort. And do keep those questions coming. If you've got questions, do chuck them in the chat or make a little note and we'll get to you later on um, when we're gonna um, chat with the panel some more. Uh, that one just blows my mind, I love it. It's, just, it's, it's futuristic in the nicest sense. There's a lot of futuristic stuff that scares the hell out of me. That one just makes me feel groovy. So um, let's see what you think and let us know. Also, it doesn't have to just be questions. You can have comments or connections in this space. You can even have criticisms as long as they're polite. Uh, and you know, let's, let's work our way through this because we're gonna try a sort of a masterclass type vibe here um, to see if we can you know, find some more solutions and as, as Beck says, you know, move on to that next best thing. On to Marion Wood from Common Sense Organics. Marion, brief introduction and what you're up to in the space. I'm Marion Wood, co-owner of Common Sense. We have six stores, four in the Wellington region, two in Auckland, and we specialise in organic food and environmentally friendly products. Packaging, obviously, is an important part of our business and of our messaging. So the guiding principles that we use are the four R's of packaging, refuse, reduce, reuse, and recycle. 
With all of these, we constantly ask ourselves, how can we make this part of a circular process and help build a circular economy? And another question we ask is who benefits from the different options and who loses? So who benefits from refusing packaging? Well, we think a big winner is the environment and also people who are concerned about the problems of packaging in the environment. And judging by the increased interest in Plastic Free July each year, that's a lot of people. Common Sense is offering customers a 10% discount on all loose produce and bulk goods to support Plastic Free July. But the biggest winner of all would be if we could change people's minds, and that means our own minds, away from always requiring the most convenient option, which is usually single use, to always requiring the most sustainable. And who loses? Well, given that the global plastics production doubled in the last 20 years, it's clear that the plastics industry has an interest, has an interest in the increased use of plastics. And it would be certainly against their business interests if there was a wholesale move away from packaging. Refusing packaging is the only option we are really proud of. Organic growing is the circular process in farming and we are not polluting the circularity by unnecessary packaging, it all makes sense. All the other processes we use are compromises. However, Let's be clear, packaging is incredibly useful. I really don't want our store workers to have to manage raw unpackaged chicken anytime soon. So from a food safety perspective, packaging will continue to have a place in our stores. So we did as much research as we could while running a business to find the best packaging options and we settled on home compostable. Why? because it continues the circularity process from plant-based materials to packaging, to compost, to growing plants again. We knew that we were early adopters, but we presumed that we would be part of a widespread campaign to put in place the infrastructure and the regulation needed to make this work. But this is where we came up against the real opposition. Instead of a dynamic campaign led by our sustainability experts, we came upon a rather lame acceptance that it just can't be done. So who benefits and who loses from this confusion? The losers are clear. James, Bex, Aidan and other innovators who are trying to produce non-polluting alternatives to plastic. And the winners are clear too. Those whose business relies on the continuation and expansion of single use plastic. These are the companies who shifted onto you and me the responsibility for polluting our seas, our soils and the very air we breathe with single use plastic. By privatizing their profits, and ensuring the losses are carried by you and me, they've perpetuated the illusion that plastics are cheap and sustainable options are more expensive. So what can we do to change the situation? Well, first of all, let's give credit to the government for introducing product stewardship for plastics. That's a great start. But we also need polluter pays legislation. Companies creating the plastic pollution need to pay levies to clean it up. This would level the playing field in terms of production costs for alternatives. Thirdly, we desperately need national standards for waste management right across the board and government regulations that enable compostable packaging to be distinguished from non-compostable packaging. And finally, 
The levies can be used by territorial authorities to establish top quality commercial and community composting. It can be done. If we really support a circular economy, let's get on with it. Kia ora tata. Fantastic. Thank you for that, Marilyn. It's a very trenchant, excellent laying out the case there. And that's, that's the sort of powerful stuff we're dealing with. I'm, we're going to now go into the panel discussion, so I'm going to bring you all in. And I'd like to jump off of um, one of the uh, comments that Marion's talking about, which is kind of like public acceptance and for, for, the, for this, because there is a sense in the current linear system that these, these items are a little bit more expensive or sometimes a little bit more inconvenient, or they're just different, and they require a little bit of cognitive switchover. To what extent do we think we're seeing, maybe I'll start with you, Marion, because you're kind of on the shop floor in a sense, like how much, I mean, you've got a particular audience, obviously, the sort of people that shop at Common Sense Organics are people that care, uh, which is great. But how how much of that push are you seeing from consumers to say, no, we're really not going to accept the same sort of crazy packaging stuff we've seen in the last sort of 20 years? I think uh, people really want to do that. They want to do the right thing. There's a huge interest in that. And that's why, um, you know, there is a lot of interest in home compostable packaging. However, um, when it's more expensive, um, that's, that's a real issue. It's a real issue for retailers. It's a real issue for, for, for everybody. And, and that expense is a, is a major problem. And that's why it's really important to level the playing field because we are paying through the nose for our oceans to be polluted and for our soils to be polluted. Um, so, so let's let's turn that around and put the costs where they should be. Yeah, sure thing. Bex, is that something? I mean, obviously you came to this. I mean, all of the innovators came to this kind of early and almost kind of in front of the wave, which is a scary and very courageous place to be. <laughs> Have you seen? Have you seen much catch up? Have you seen people going, yeah, actually, right, we're ready for this now. Let's just do it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's different in different uh, different parts of the world. So I feel that New Zealand and Australia are, are a lot further ahead than some of the other countries, which is quite interesting. Um, but I think it's such a journey and such an education process. And we're on that journey and that education process as well. And we're constantly learning. And as I said earlier, I don't think there is one solution that's going to fit all. But we do need some really well thought out guiding principles, um, you know, single single polymers when it comes to plastics, um, hun, you know, recycled contents and things like that, um, composting infrastructure. So it is such a complex industry. And, and I think that's really hard for merchants and, and users of packaging as well as end consumers. Uh, and I think that's what we're really, really struggling with at the moment is how you cut through all of that and get some clear messaging so people know what the best options are and what they do with them at the end of life. Yeah, true. That's a, I mean, that's a big part of it. Hey, there's the enthusiasm, but there's also the education to know what to do with this stuff. And that's tricky. That sort of fits into the systems part of it as well. I was going to talk to you about that, James. Kind of the, there's a drive towards interchangeability of, of a complete switch out of going, OK, I want it to look and perform exactly like the other thing did. And you can see why, because it undercuts the need for so much education. But does, is there, are you feeling that tension between that and coming at it completely differently? Like a lot of your stuff, for example, is packaging around another package. Eh? How much are you able to get involved systemically and say, well, why don't you just do it differently? You know? Yeah, there's a, like, I think we're trying to, to, to focus on both of those aspects because one aspect is like we've got technology ready to go, um, direct drop and replacement. It's easier for customers to understand. Um, and it just sort of becomes that, that cost discussion with them. Um, but I think like this is where, why we're really in this business. It's, it's, we're looking sort of at this greater field of biofabrication. And can we move into this new sort of industry and technology where we create things differently for more renewable resources? And um, so that's where I'm like the current state of this technology that we're working with might always just fit really well as that direct replacement model. Um, but we're only using this technology as a slight step away from how mycelium already grows within, within nature. Um, so I think like as we do more, more innovation, we start working with more customers um, and understanding their processes, um, that will allow us to sort of um, 
uh, you know, find new ways of doing things. And probably a more like realistic example is I'm not an expert at that. And that's in terms of trying to find those brand new ways of using this composite material. So we've got this really exciting process where we're wanting to work with customers, with designers, get this material into their hands and just see what comes back to us through that feedback as well. So I think that's a really important process, you know, around all of this is, is learning what we can learn by putting this material into our customers' hands and they're probably going to be the best ones on on learning how to use it differently. Um, but but I think that's a massive, massive part of it. We have to um, look at replacing or changing ways that we currently do things, um, but sometimes we might not yet know how we could completely change things. Um, so there'll be a bit of a transition stage where we might start with the easy low-hanging fruit, but that must be only a step in a direction towards making more systemic change in the long term. Yeah, I think that's the crux of it. I, it, it it's keeping that kind of conversation going and keeping it, pushing at the edges to say, well, yeah, we've made you a convenient mm. option for this, but that's not where we're going to stop. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's really exciting as well, the idea that, as this stuff emerges more, it's getting it in the hands of designers, product designers, and people like that that can think about it differently and really start to be creative around it and, and, and push you guys as well and go, well, how about this? Let's do something different with that material. That's fantastic. Aidan, are you seeing that kind of education enthusiasm play out in a kind of level of the, the kind of business to business side of things as well? Because I presume you're dealing with people that are going, look, I've got a crop, I want to put it in this. But I, how much enthusiasm is there out there? How much understanding in, in the businesses that are approaching you? Yeah, really good question, Andy. Um, I think that, you know, it, it's quickly a growing space. And when we talk about both businesses that we deal with within the produce area and in other industries as well, um, we quickly learn people are excited and naturally they're drawn towards wanting to do the right thing in the space and look at the right applications. But we've got to be really uh, in our process there. How do we get the right fit going and how do we make sure that people aren't overwhelmed or struggling to navigate that those waters of sustainability which can become quite a bit of a rabbit hole so there's lots of different materials out there um, new ones are being released every day uh, which is exciting but also a bit daunting sometimes so from our perspective you know how do we help guide people through that process to match that excitement with the right end solution and that normally starts with thinking about hey sustainable patching why do, you, why do you even use it? Um, what is the purpose of the packaging? What material best suits that? Is that a, a renewable material, a fibrous one, um, a plastic material? Because as Mary put it before, it's you know, a poultry type application or depending on what the intended requirements are, such as shelf life or food safety. Then we also need to definitely be looking at the environmental um, science behind that as well. What else? DAs back up the, the material and the claims of what it wants to be. Um, what sort of certifications does it have in place? And finally, part of that missing equation sometimes that people tend to overlook is what do your customers think too? Include them in the conversation. See what they want to see. Um, everyone wants sustainable packaging, um, but what does that look like to your customers as well? Awesome. Great answer. Fantastic. Marin, you touched on some of the kind of uh, political framing around this as well and some of the regulatory stuff we're looking to see where are we at with that now because we've, we've definitely seen some positive stuff come through with procurement and some of this some of this work coming through on product stewardship as well but are there still bug raising i wish they'd just get around to x or or what sort of support do you think we should be seeing to, to really uh, like accelerate this process well i i, I as i said i think it's great that uh, the whole concept of product stewardship is is being applied to plastics that's that's a great start but we we need legislation and regulations uh, for um, home compostable packaging to be given a fighting chance mm -hmm. um, if you can't distinguish between plastics and and uh, compostable packaging, well, then you can't actually sort it into and put it in the right place. I mean, it's very basic um, and, and it can be done, um, but it requires a nationwide approach. And at the moment, we have each local authority recycling and managing waste in a totally different way. Um, and we are, we're miles away from being able to sort compostable packaging and, and, and separate it. I mean, the, the very basics, these need to be put in place, and, but, it, but, but they can be put in place. 
you know, let's get on with it. Let's campaign for these to be put in place as quickly as possible. Yeah, sure thing. Yeah, I think that I think there's, there's definitely still work to be done. It was, it was fantastic to have a governance group with uh, local authorities and um, government representatives during the packaging masterclass process and still working with us because it was really great to get them rubbing up against the, the the business and the people on the ground and see how it works and go well, how can we how can we change things and that does seem to be playing out obviously it's a pretty chocker legislative uh, kind of uh, time at the moment uh, especially as we run into the next next election but maybe let's make it maybe we can make an election election issue that would be fantastic bex how are you seeing that play on the on the ground with yourself like are you still having to grapple with rules and regulations and when you know when you've got nationwide customers particularly go well it work here it's a bit tricky there you know is that kind of tripping you up yeah absolutely i mean and we quite a lot of our business is overseas so 92 percent is outside of new zealand and we are starting to see legislative changes so the uk has just brought in a um a tax on virgin plastics so if you have less than 30 percent recycled content in your packaging uh, you pay you pay a levy, which is fabulous, and it's what we need to see. And we they're going to increase that every year or two. Um, so there's definitely legislative things happening all around the world, and, and lots of changes that we've we've got to be aware of. I think we've also got to be really careful with some of these blanket rules that we're making as well, that it, it doesn't prevent some of the innovation that's coming through, uh, and that we're not creating solutions that are are sometimes worse than what they're replacing. Uh, and I, I think we see that quite often. It, it may have a really good end of life option, but then the the carbon footprint could be really high if the LCAs are showing that. And, and a lot of companies don't actually have, you know, the finances to be able to do LCAs on all the products that they're creating. So I think we've there's such a fine balancing act and um, we've just all got to work together on that. Yeah, true, true enough. Uh, James, I was going to talk to you about that. How hard has it been for you in the regulatory sense to get product to market? Because probably your product on, uh, is one of those that people go, what, 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 what is this? What do I do with it? What box does it fit in? Um, how hard has it been to get it to the point of people going, oh yeah, I understand what you're looking at there and these are the rules around it? Well, we've, we've been lucky to be working with a company, Ecubative Design, based out of the States and like the global leaders in this technology space. So I think there, there was a lot of communication and work that they had done prior to us that um, they probably experienced a lot, a lot more of those problems. Um, like one of the big things that we, we get is, uh, you know, biosecurity um, because it's a, you know, if it, we're using fungi to grow this material and um, like for us, a problem was actually bringing in the fungal species that Ecovated was using overseas into New Zealand. We couldn't do that. So we had to develop our own fungal species. Um, what, but we thought that was a problem at first, but that caused us to become more innovative and, and find our own fungal species. Um, when we subsequently learned with raising capital, having your own IP is very important for investors' perspective. So that was where something, you know, that problem turned into a, a, a bit of um, something positive for us. Um, but we just communicate to people, let them know our process that when we have that finished material, we've, we pasteurize everything, um, just like traditional wood composite products that are on the market get used. Um, at the end of it, um, the mycelium is killed during that heat process, so it becomes an inert material at that stage. And then on that end of it, it's, it's safe to go out. Um, but it's something where, even though we don't have much regulation stopping us from sending it, communicating it, because people using common sense sort of wonder, well, will my packaging start growing mushrooms? Um, will that create spore problems? And um, But all of that's like science communication. And yes, it's an issue that we need to get through, but it's also extremely valuable just getting that opportunity to communicate to customers because they want to learn. So it's um, um, we're under no illusion that there are some, there's a lot of communication that we need to do effectively with this. And we've always just looked at that as an opportunity and not, not really a problem. Um, when you're dealing with new technology, that's just part and parcel of it. Fair play, fair play. Excellent. Well, let's let's bring in some of the um, some of the questions from from our guests, uh, from people out there in the audience. One of them that's come up pretty strongly, which is which is a classic, but I think it's worth going over again, particularly as it, as it shifts, is the end of life the end of life story for all of what you're producing. It's a complex one, particularly with the compostables and the commercially compostable home compostable elements. How are you finding that in terms of 
because you know there's always this thing against well maybe we just should just go reusable so it doesn't have to go anywhere because it's just too complicated Aidan how are you finding that in your work and is there stuff that you need to change or move to navigate differently yeah good question um I think that when whenever we talk about you know really technical components then something I think most of us tend to learn as soon as we start getting involved with packaging is it's a little bit more technical than you think at a surface level um so how do we how do we bring you know, someone like a customer or consumer on, on that journey to understand very clearly what happens to the packaging at end of life because it's really important to be transparent and honest and to be very well validated in that process. So um, generally speaking, a simple story will work best. Um, so being able to communicate that, uh, we've seen that examples where being able to communicate it easily on the packaging itself is proves really effective. Um, Prep ARL is one really good example of that, where hey, it's getting picked up more widely acknowledged with an A and Z as a recognizable logo that does have effect on uh, the way people perceive the patching and what to do with it at end of life. Um, I think outside of that, we just need to make sure that hey, um, have a think about your your target customer and who are the type of people that this patching is going to be interacting with or where it's going to go. So, are they the type where hey, based on where they're located, they do have easy access to say. Um, whatever resin identification code, plastic material um, recycling, or are they, you know, um, the type of target market where they will have access to home compostable materials or within a geographical location that does have some kind of collection or whatever it might be. Sure thing, cool. And that's, Marion, in terms of people walking out the store with, with goods in your stores, how confident are you that they know where this package is going to go, even if it is different packaging? Uh, that's a real issue, and an awful lot of people in urban settings don't have home composts. Um, so, you know, um, that's why it's really important for um, local authorities to support community composting. And, uh, 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 and, and it's really important that manufacturers like uh, these guys actually create products that are home compostable and do break down. Uh, and break down fairly rapidly. Mm. Um, so, having said that, I've completely forgotten what your original question was. I think that's great. Though. Let's move from there. But let's let's, let's see if, if, for that challenge. Base. Is that is that a challenge you can you can go for that everything could be home compostable, or is that is that going to be? Yeah, a look, far? we've we've tried to make all of our compostable range where possible home compostable, uh, so that it can go into a home compost. Because there's a very big difference between something that breaks down in sort of 90 to 180 days, and I think James, you were saying yours is 30 days, to something that takes five years to break down, uh, and and that's just not viable for people with composts at home. So yeah, we really push for that, and I would really encourage everything's got to be certified as well. We've got to be really strict on certifications. We've got to be really careful around the way we labeling things, whether it's recycle, recyclable, or compostable, or whatever it is, home compostable. Uh, and that's something that we have really tried to set the bar as incredibly high as possible as around our messaging and communication and not promising more than we can deliver. We always sort of try to under promise and, and show the warts and all, uh, and then you're not setting yourself up uh, for, yeah. for customer disappointment and also for criticism because people do want to criticise. Mm. And that, like, that's, that's a fantastic thing to point out as well because otherwise we're undermining not just your business but undermining also the movement as a whole going if there's something new going oh it's probably one of those things that doesn't really work no, no, no. Mm. um yeah Jackson, i was gonna talk oh sorry go back oh you yeah, know we've actually because we've been so honest and upfront with our communication we've actually lost customers over it because mm. they have gone to competitors and said oh well they've said it's home compostable when we we oh. won't actually put that label on it because it hasn't been certified so I think if you are making choices for packaging, really get to know those packaging suppliers and, and, and make sure that you're not, people aren't greenwashing with the information that they're providing. Yeah, absolutely. That's why it would be really nice to have some sort of national standards out there, right? Because there is still a little bit of a claim and counterclaim situation going on. And if you're losing customers over that, you know, you, you'll probably get them back long term. I think they'll probably go away, get disappointed and they go, all right, OK, now they'll learn a little bit more. Um, I was going to come to you, James, about kind of adding nutrition because there's, there's the issue around nutrition in compost, though, but a lot of these materials don't add a great deal to compost, so you can't just kind of pile it in there in massive amounts. Your products, of, of, of any of them, maybe could, could, could you slot a bit of nutrition in there? Could you make that 
Before, yeah, and, and Perseus is one comment um, just to Bex in that, like, how she said that, you know, we've actually lost some customers over um, communicating transparently the realities um, of that this isn't a silver bullet. And it's like, that's the exact type of communication that needs to be happening so that we don't end up with greenwashing just causing more confusion. And I absolutely believe that in the long run, that is a, a smart business decision to be making because when cuffs, when companies realise that they've potentially greenwashed their product, they're going to come in racing that were a bit more transparent at that time earlier. Um, but no, th this is what I was sort of itching to get at is around um, um, like with our, with our composite material, we're sort of very lucky that by the simple nature that it's 98% wood chip and 2% mycelium. And we use about a, a tablespoon of, of, of various types of like flowers, just like wheat flour um, per kg. We've got a very simple product that, that fits within existing commercial composting models really well in terms of its nutritional profile required. Um, so we're just really lucky there. The flip side of it is that this material is not going to be able to replace every single form of polystyrene. So it's going to just be one of many solutions that are required. Um, but when we talked earlier about the, 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 the bigger systems change that happen after the first steps that we take, I think this is like we've created home compostable um, uh, packaging, these certifications, and just the name insinuates that it has to fit within these existing compost models. You know, commercial compost is set up without worrying about this. And this has been a massive change now. So, you know, I sometimes wonder if we expect existing compost models to accept, say we had an inflection point of 15% of global plastics that could switch to a biodegradable polymer dip. Under the existing compost models, we have to start cutting down trees just to run the compost machines. That's mm -hmm. not going to work long term. But like something that I always think about, which is a potential great value of biopolymers, could we use this more to standardize plastics, bring in something really new and different to standardize plastics and maybe develop more of a, you know, bacterial sort of chemical recycling um, for them where they can fit really well into. Um, now, yes, it won't go into composting. And I think we should always be looking for those far more circular um, opportunities. But in the reality, if we're not going to, that's not going to cut the mustard for every type, um, you know, I sort of hold a lot more faith that biodegradable polymers we can use to sort of reset the plastics that we use to develop a brand new type of, um, you know, recycling system for it, but one that can have a much higher throughput. Um, and, um, you know, I sort of worry that if we keep promoting these, these, these biodegrade or these biopolymers and that composting is the only solution that works that makes them better, have we just put up this massive, you know, uh, wall not too far in the future? And um, but that was sort of an example of how I'm thinking. How could these plastics, you know, lead to much greater systems change? And um, and it's not surprising that you know an existing hundred year old commercial composting model or composting, you know, much older than that. Um, I'm like, yeah, we might not expect a, a very old system to adopt this new input. Um, so I'm I'm really open and think we have to look at how can we change the commercial composting scene to create a business model that makes sense for these these materials to be going through it. Because um, if we rely on the current one, will we just run into a, a massive problem in the near future? Yeah, that's a big challenge, but it's also part of the excitement, eh, is that the, the, the plastics problem is a symptom of a larger problem about the system. And if we once we start looking at it really seriously, we come up against those barriers and say, Okay, what else do we need to change? And we've got food waste composting, you know, and digestion, biodigestion coming in as well at scale in New Zealand. So like how do these systems, how can they play or play with each other to make a really efficient sort of circular system across all? Mm. Um, Marin, every you... every cost is is when you look at it that way, it's like it's a cost, it's a pain, like you drag your heels and try to fix it. But if we look at the dollar values of those costs as an opportunity, just that simple change in mindset, um, you know hopefully this could be a good use of, of conscious capitalism where we create opportunities out of these problems to innovate. Um, like for myself, I'm like, I've got 50 years of work ahead of me. There's plenty of time to be thinking about those long-term changes that we can make from these problems that might create problems over the next few years. 
Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Marin, I was gonna ask you a question around how much can you do at point of sale to assist customers making these choices? And, and is there stuff you'd like, because obviously you're leading the way in, in terms of in, in the retail space. Are there things you'd like to see the big players doing, kind of like the countdowns, the big supermarkets doing at point of sale to, to give the customers a little nudge in the right, right direction? I don't understand the question, Andy. So the sort of information you're, um, you're providing in Common Sense mm. for people on packaging, I assume, I assume you're, you're doing that. I wonder if, if you'd like to see more of that in, the, in some of the bigger players in the big supermarkets and stuff to help the customer to, to use these products as they come through as they start to mainstream. Um, in retail, people don't read um, point of sale stuff information like that. I mean, people, mm. people are not... People want the retailers to do it for them. Mm. Uh, and I think that's, that, that's very much the case. So one of, one of the things about common sense is that our customers trust us that we are trying to do the right thing and trying to make the right decisions. And so they, they, will, they will trust the decisions that we are making, which is a huge responsibility. But I think that is a responsibility that retailers need to uh, Need, need, need to take on if we want to call ourselves sustainable businesses. Absolutely. But yeah, and I think that's a great comment because it's it would be all too easy to go, well, we put the information, because we stress the information and get the information right, but there's a, there's a stage beyond that, isn't there? We go, we put the information on. So, so but yeah, but, yeah it's not so on. much um, point of sale stuff. It's also, I mean, my question is, uh, for, for myself and for, for retailers, how do we help customers change their mindsets? Mm. How do we help them not move from one kind of packaging to another, but to move to no packaging? And I think that's a really important uh, point because, you know, we're not going to solve the issues of climate change. We're not going to solve the problems of biodiversity loss unless we as humans realize that we have to pull back on our consumption of absolutely everything. Mm. Um, and packaging is no exception. So the most important thing that we could do is to help our customers refuse packaging. I think that's absolutely, that's interesting, eh? Yeah, it's like one of being one of those businesses to try and put yourself out of business. So we'll, you know, <laughs> we, we shouldn't be around, <laughs> we should think cleverly. What I'll do now, I'm just going to go around each person and just sort of say, is there something you'll be bursting to say that I haven't, we haven't touched on? Bex, is there something you kind of, or a sum up of, of some of the things you've heard? <laughs> you've just put me on the spot quickly, but um, I have just read Alan's put in the chat talking about um, Greenhouse. I think he said no, he noticed climate change hasn't been men mentioned as packaging plays such an important role. Marion just so, did it. Well done, Marion. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think no packaging, but some you know packaging does play a vital role and i always joked when i first started the company that in an ideal world we wouldn't be needed as you were just saying andy but it does protect goods and we've done a lot of studies where we don't use packaging and, and the food gets destroyed or the clothing gets ruined and and the cost of that is actually higher than the packaging itself so i think it does play a role uh and we need to come up with creative solutions around that. And so I just would talk to Alan's a little bit around the climate change. Um, I don't know if you saw the slide in the presentation that I did in the first piece, uh, but the, we do LCOs on all of our products uh, and our latest products, Plastic has got a 75% less carbon footprint than any other packaging solution out there. And what we're trying to do with our packaging is get that to 0%. Um, we're really working on that and believe we can because by removing the pollution from the environment, there's actually a really positive uh, CO2 impact as well. And so we're just working with uh, companies who do those LCAs to work out how we measure that. And, and we believe that we can actually get packaging that's at, at zero, which is super exciting. And, that, and that's the future that we see. Awesome. Aidan, what, what, what's keeping you up at night these days in terms of the exciting thing or the thing you go, whoa, that's scary? <laughs> Too much, Andy. Uh, but I think um, I think um, you know there's, there's there's a lot of I think we just wanted to hark back to what was mentioned earlier on in the conversation, which is there's so much going on in this space, and there are some really really cool exciting things, and a few things touched on today that are a little bit scary as well. But I think I just want to encourage everyone to to continue to be open in the space. Um, 
be open to making sure you're encouraging that innovation, but also take a very methodical approach. You know, there's no necessarily um, right material, no silver bullet, which has come up today. Uh, plastic has some really great applications and some applications where it's over relied upon and same for fossil materials or recyclable ones or whatever it is. Um, and to Alan's point as well, um, materials that have positive climate uh, climate benefits as well. So I'd encourage um, I'd encourage you to make sure that hey, you're constantly reviewing your packaging um, for a sustainable sustainability function. Um, if where you're not sure, get access to the right resources or right contacts. You know, there's a fantastic community out there. Uh, more resources available than ever before. I think even SBN has some on your website. I saw a fantastic glossary of terms at one point. Um, so that's a little shout out, but. Uh, <laughs> It, you know, make sure that you reach out to an expert if you're not sure. Um, and at the end of the day, make sure you're doing right by um, your brand and your customers too. In that space. Fantastic. Thanks, Aiden. James, where do you see this going in the next sort of 10, 15 years? I think it's, um, it's something that we need to be, um, you know, these communications, whether like, let's think from the perspective of your, you're using packaging. Um, you need to be, I think looking at these conversations need to be happening with the logistical supply partners, um, with the manufacturers right at the supply chain, all the way with the end of life consultants, uh, the end of life managers, because it can sometimes feel a little bit sort of broken. And I think this is the, the role that the, the purchases of these materials have a massive role to play. Um, even small businesses, if we're out there um, uh, sort of, I can't remember the figure off the top of my head. I knew it, knew it a year ago of what percentage small to medium sized enterprises make up of the economy of businesses. Um, Cause sometimes they can feel they might not have that power to influence their supply chains. But if you look at the fact that it's like a it's very, very GDP, high number. I think, I think it's 80% I was going GDP. To say, yeah. Yeah. And that when you look at that, there can collectively be a voice there that can be a very powerful collective voice because um, as Marine said, it was, it's not just about creating new materials. It's about can we reduce? And I like love thinking about the opportunities within, you know, can we set up more distributed manufacturing, shorter supply chains, more local supply chains, all these things that in these critical places where we need high performing packaging, we can still be using them. Um, but if we can reduce time that food packaging needs to keep packaging fresh because of faster supply chains, um, we can probably substitute on the performance of it that might allow us to then move to monofilms. So that's an example where I think of can we innovate supply chains, the logistics of it, to shorten the window that we need to keep food fresh, then that could enable monofilms over multi-barrier films. Um, so it's that it, we really, I think, innovation, even from the material side of it, will come from that greater communication um, from all parts of the supply chain. So... Um, but it's letting purchases of materials know these businesses that as a, even a small to medium sized enterprise collectively get on this bandwagon um, and there is going to be a huge voice there to force that change because um, at the end of the day, that's where the money's being spent. Um, they're the ones that are you know paying the bills. Um, and when there's a large enough collective voice there, that can be the most powerful one. Um, if the suppliers that you're going to buy off um, if you want them to change. And so that's it. So that's the message, folks. So we need to get out there. We need to do, do your research, but support those that are doing the innovation and also get out there and advocate for change, as Marion's pointing out. You know, get out there and talk to people, talk to your politicians. There's an election next year. Push for the changes you need to see to make this a, a, a work for everyone. Massive thank you to all of our panellists. It's, it's Bex McCleskey for Better Packaging, Aidan Sharp from Punchbowl, James Ferrer from Biofab, and Marion Wood from Common Sense Organics. It's been brought to you by the Sustainable Business Network. You can find out more about our work on, in, on our website at sustainable.org.nz, which includes uh, a load of stuff on plastic packaging and the circular economy. There's useful tools for you to get, get, get to grips with there. And obviously, our circular economy directory has many of these, all of these companies, I think, on them and more. Um, so you can find out where you can start, uh, get this stuff from. Um, our next event is our AGM tomorrow. If you're a member of uh, this, our network, you can get down to uh, Eden Terrace, 4.15 to 6.30. So you can come and see our annual general meeting. It'll be a summation of everything we've done of the year and you can vote for our new board and have some snacks and drinks. So if you want to come along to that, please do. Our next hot take is why is no one talking about their chemical footprint? And that's coming to you Wednesday, the 10th of August. You can sign up again on our website. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, stay with us for the hour and um, have a lovely afternoon.
Cheers, Andy. Cheers, all. See you, everyone.